So a very good afternoon, FMG candidates. I hope you all have done your FMG exams in a great, great way. So this is FMG ENT recall uh, session. So by the usual trend, uh, this uh, FMG exam usually have around 12 to 15 questions from the uh, ENT subject alone. So this year is also no exception for that. Okay. So again, I have organized the question starting from ear, then nose and throat. The strange pattern of this particular year's FMG questions was uh, more number of questions were asked from nose. Okay. So, uh, and uh, very one or few, two questions were asked from ear, which was usually not the case. Usually ear is the prime candidate for asking a lot of questions, but this year there were more questions from the nose, rhinology part. So we'll discuss one, one question at a time. We'll start with otology. The first question is, a yeah, 50 years old male presented with complaints of swelling below the ears and pain over the lobule of the ear. Was not able to close his eyes completely. He's also having difficulty in eating food. Which of the following now is most likely to be damaged? So the answer for this question, they have given four options, greater auricular nerve, auricular temporal nerve, facial nerve, vagus nerve. All these nerves are relevant for ear. So no no is irrelevant so all these posts are relevant for you so now the important thing that you should understand from this question is the patient was not able to close his eyes completely and he is also having difficulty in heating the food these two points are clearly in favor of some facial palsy okay so this is a lower motor neuron facial palsy. So here by the history, there is no history of any trauma or any surgery or any infection, which means that this should be a yeah, idiopathic element type of facial palsy. What is the idiopathic element type of facial palsy called as? It is none other than Bell's palsy. It's none other than Bell's palsy. All right. Now, the first one, what are the features of Bell's palsy? So number one is Loss of frowning of forehead. Loss of nasolabial fold. Deviation of angle of mouth okay incomplete closure of eyelids okay so these are the features of bell's palsy so what could be the Treatment for Bell's palsy, we should not do surgery for Bell's palsy. We should give only steroids, either oral or systemic steroids. So the dose of steroids should be one gram per kilogram. Okay. The dose should be one milligram per kilogram body weight okay fine now so we have confirmed it to be a facial palsy how we are going to correlate other points from this particular question see here swelling below the ears and pain over lobule of the ear so 
Why pain over the lobule of the ear? Does facial nerve supplies the lobule of the ear? Let's see. What are the supply of what are the nerve supply of pinna? So the lateral part of the pinna is supplied by two important nerves. One is auriculo temporal nerve. Then lesser occipital nerve. Then greater auricular nerve. So these three are the major nerve supply, which is sensory nerve supply of pinna. All right. Apart from this, two other nerves also supplies the pinna, which is a yeah, facial nerve branch and Arnold branch of Vegas. So this facial nerve, see over here, supplies a small area over the pinna. Over the pinna, which could be a part of lobule. This Arnold branch of vagus mainly supply tragus. So in these settings, so facial nerve also supplies a small part of the pinna. All right. So out of these five nerves, we are choosing three nerves: auriculotemporal nerve, facial nerve. Arnold branch of vagus. So these one, four, and five supplies the external auditory canal. Clear? So what about the middle ear? The middle ear is supplied by. Jacobson branch of glasso pharyngeal nerve. All right. Jacobson branch of glasso pharyngeal nerve. So these are the nerve supply of the ear, out of which the ear has only a minimal sensory supply of the facial. Uh, over the uh, external auditory canal and pinna. Okay, so if the facial nerve is affected, means it could cause loss of sensation over the posterior superior part of the external auditory canal, part of pinna. So this question depicts that only. Okay, so this swelling below the ears, so swelling below the ears is again, uh, it could be it could be depicted. If this particular thing is given means. It could be depicted of a parotid tumor. Okay. So, which could again cause an element type of facial palsy. So, again, the same discussion only. Okay. So, in that case, it could not be an idiopathic facial palsy. So, if this, if these three words are given, it is parotid tumor causing facial palsy. Not given, it is idiopathic element type of facial palsy, which is Bell's palsy. So that's why I kept this question in two times. Okay, fine. So again, a question from the facial palsy, which of the following drug will be the best to prescribe for facial palsy? The options are naproxen, opioids, acyclovir, prednisolone. The best option is prednisolone, which is 
one milligram per kilogram body weight. Okay, it should be started. within 24 hours of injury okay Fine. should be started within 24 hours of injury so few unresponsive cases the cause for idiopathic facial palsy could be due to HSV infection. In that case, there should be combination of steroid with acyclovir. Steroid with acyclovir. So that should be the treatment. But if the option has both steroid and acyclovir, that could be the correct answer. But when we compare acyclovir with prednisolone, prednisolone is the best answer compared with acyclovir. So if these two are given, you can choose that particular answer. Okay. So that's all about ear questions. Now entering into the rhinology part, a few questions have been asked from rhinology. The important one from the embryology part of the rhinology is this question. An infant had difficulty in breathing, which improved on crying. What is the diagnosis? Final atresia, laryngeal malacia, laryngeal verb, nasal labial cyst. So these two are developmental anomalies of larynx. So these two are developmental anomalies of nose. So going by the question, so the answer for this particular question is coinal atresia. How and why? See, we are having nose. We are having the airway. Okay. So, this is the nose. This is the posterior coina. Just take for example, if this posterior end of the nose is blocked, consider if the larynx has been blocked. Okay. So how it will improve the condition. So on crying, which is exerted more on crying, there will be more movement over the soft palate. That is more movement over the soft palate and the tongue. So which will come and meet each other and it will increase the space for breathing. Now, if the child is crying means, the child is crying means, there will be more exertion of epiglottis over the laryngeal inlet. Okay. So that will decrease the space for breathing. Yeah. So if there is lesion over the posterior coina of the nose, that congenital lesion will improve on crying. That is coinal atresia. Okay. Whereas larynx anomalies such as laryngeal malacia and laryngeal verb that will decrease space for breathing while crying. So that will worsen on crying. That will person on crying okay so that is the major difference between these two levels of congenital anomalies either it could be if it is a congenital anomaly of nose it improves 
if it is of larynx it declines or worsens on crying so that is the major difference so what is coinal atresia so so there is a membrane that forms between that forms between the posterior coina and the posterior pharyngeal wall. That membrane is called bucconasal membrane of Hochstetter. Bucconasal membrane of Hochstetter. So, this membrane should disappear at birth. So, if it doesn't disappear, so persistence of buccal membrane is called coil atresia. Okay. So the patient will present with dyspnea and cyanosis. Okay. So these neonates being obligate intranasal breathers. For instance, these children, these pediatric age group will know to breathe only through the nose. By inbuilt mechanism, they don't have this ability to open the mouth and breathe. So they don't just do that naturally. So obligate intranasal breathers. For that reason, you should create an artificial chamber for mouth breathing. It is called Megovan nipple. This is called Megovan's nipple. So it's a oral airway. So this is only a temporary technique for time being. Okay. So So definitive treatment is either do a serial dilatations or you do excision with flap cover. Excision with flap cover. So these are the points put into coin latricia. Coin latricia is a part of charge syndrome okay fine there are few other anomalies at the root of nose we are having nasal It's a simple dermatitis, or you'll be having nasal glioma. So, yeah, lesion. Previously originated from Dura. Now the connection is cut off. 
that's all. Whereas in nasal encephalocele, persistent connection. Okay, so persistent connection between nasal and the brain matter. So this no increase in size with increased intracranial pressure. Whereas here there will be increase in size on increase or sneezing. This is called first and Berg sign positive. Okay, so this is first and Berg sign negative. Nasal and cephalocele is first and Berg sign positive. So again, an important congenital anomaly of nose. So another congenital anomaly of nose is nasolabial cyst at the floor of nasal cavity. Treatment is excision by sublabial root. See, I'm exposing the sublabial mucosa of this particular patient. Then I'm going into the tumor and I am removing the congenital lesion. Okay, so this is a benign cystic swelling okay fine so important aspects about the embryology of nose has been discussed now let's enter into the anatomical aspects of the nose a question has been asked bulla ethmoidals drains into which of the following question wise it is very important most of the r cells of the ethmoid drains into middle meatus except except posterior ethmoidal R cell and sphenoid sinus into superior meatus. Sphenoid sinus drains into inferior sphenoid ethmoidal recess. So inferior meatus is meant for nasolacrimal duct drainage. Okay. So let me explain some of the key landmarks of the lateral wall of the nose. So just by looking at the two-dimensional picture of the lateral wall of the nose, it is very hard for you to understand the anatomical orientation. So let me explain with the help of the real-time practical example. See, this is a straight view. I'm looking at the bird's nest. So bird's nest, I could see only the bird. And the other structures, how it is related to the board, it is in front of the board or behind the board, it is it is attaching the board. I'm not able to find out with this image. So if I go closer and I have a three-dimensional depiction of the bird's nest, I could find out the relation between the corresponding surrounding bony structures with that of our bird's nest. So this bird's nest, I'm comparing it with a structure called middle meatus. So this middle meatus is surrounded by a lot of imaginary structures as well as some anatomical bony structures. All these structures will intermingle itself with each other and will form a lot of structures. Those structures have been given a name called osteomeatal complex. So basically most of the R cells, sinuses of the nasal cavity drains into the middle meatus, except posterior ethmoidal sinus and sphenoid sinus. So those structures drains into the middle meatus. That middle meatus is surrounded by a lot of bones here and there. 
lot of imaginary space spaces over there so all these will contribute to the formation of an unit called osteomatal complex or osteomatal unit c with this picture i could see only a few bony landmarks such as middle turbinate septum bulla so other structures i could not see with these so whereas see i am having unsnare process in fundibulum hiatus seminaris a lot of structures so what are the definition for those particular structures how i am going to remember those structures is to be seen so first thing you just make one thing clear so this is the this is the middle meatus so this middle meatus has important bony structures such as number 1 is middle turbinate number 2 is uncinate bone number 3 is this one which is ethmoidal bulla okay now if we closely look over here this is the uncinate bone which we are talking about okay so the space between this imaginary space between this uncinate bone and the lateral wall of the nose we call it by the name infundibulum another important clinical significance of this infundibulum is these maxillary sinus ethmoid sinus this frontal sinus all these sinus will drain into this imaginary structure of infundibulum this is point number 1 now if this is the infundibulum we are having i have already told you a structure called ethmoidal bulla so the space below the ethmoidal bulla we call it by the name hiatus semilunaris a semilunaris a semilunar shaped space that lies between the hiatus that lies be below the ethmoidal bulla is called as hiatus semilunaris so let me write it for you so semilunar structure below the ethmoidal bulla ethmoidal bulla is actually an ethmoidal arsen okay so infundibulum imaginary space uncinate bone and lateral wall okay so ethmoidal bulla is nothing but most consistent ethmoidal arsel most consistent ethmoidal arsel so posterior osteomatal complex is nothing but a complex that drains the posterior ethmoidal cells okay so that completes some of the important confusing concepts about the lateral wall of the nose so hiatus semilunaris infundibulum ethmoidal bulla you should never forget this so almost all the structures all the sinuses are drains draining into the um, middle meatus a question from epistaxis a 42 years old female presented with bleeding from nose the commonest artery that could be the reason for this is for this we should understand 
which artery is the most common culprit for causing a fist access it is none other than that sphenopalatine artery otherwise called artery of epistaxis sphenopalatine artery or artery of epistaxis all right yes. now what are the arteries supplying the nasal septum we are having anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries which are all branches from internal carotid artery sphenopalatin artery greater palatin artery these two are branches of maxillary artery superior labial artery is a branch of facial artery okay so these two are branches of external carotid artery okay fine so so you should be very clear with the bleeding arteries uh, that are culprits for epistaxis all right Fine. Moving on to the next question, which is second from the analogy part. A 54 years old male presented with the right sided nasal obstruction for six months. On examination, there was an irregular mass present over the lateral wall of the nose. The possible cause could be so irregular mass over the lateral wall of the nose. Okay. So they have not given anything about the etiology of this particular mass. The patient, whether he is allergic or whether he is having signs of weight loss. Or loss of appetite so no particular thing has been given pertaining to the etiopathogenesis for this particular patient simple thing unilateral irregular mass seen over the lot of the nose it could be even a tumor but there are no findings pertaining or no history pertaining to the tumor is there so first the most apt answer for this particular question is androquinal polyp okay so other options are ethmoidal polyp, rhinosporiosis, and rhinolith. Okay. For rhinosporiosis, you should be searching for history of pond water bath and then mass studded with spores okay in rhinolith there should be history of nasal foreign body that have now become a granulation filled mass okay fine so the answer for this particular question is anthraconal polyp. So let's compare the difference between anthraconal polyp and ethmoidal polyp. So site of anthraconal polyp is maxillary antrum. The site of ethmoidal polyp is ethmoidal sinus. The age of anthraconal polyp is adolescent here adults the cause is mainly infection the cause of ethmoidal polyps mainly allergy so you just think of this if you are getting an infection i could easily treat your infection because that infection can be treated by antibiotics but if i'm getting allergy that allergy is not completely correctable okay there are possibilities that the allergy could come again and again so the recurrence is less common in antraconal polyp it is more common in 
ethmoidal polyp the topical treatment is used for only short period because no recurrence topical treatment is for long period okay fine so anterocoronal polyp always move posteriorly because of the downward sloping nature of the nasal floor direction of air current always anterior posteriorly the direction of the cilia of the nasal mucosa is beating posteriorly the opening of accessory maxillary ostium is projected posteriorly so these are the reasons the anterocoronal polyp see here it is starting over the lateral wall it is not coming anteriorly it is going only posteriorly because the posterior movement of the polyp has a lot of underlying etiology just, just such as flow sloping of nasal flow direction of air current is anterior posteriorly direction of cilia is again anterior posteriorly the opening of accessory maxillary ostium is projected posteriorly due to these reasons i could see the tumor more posteriorly located that's why the name implies antrum to coena antrum to coena it is anterocoenal polyp whereas the ethmoidal polyp originates from the ethmoidal region it could be seen anteriorly also it would be seen posteriorly also it has no propensity for going only posterior so that completes the difference between the polyps okay fine a middle aged man presented with saddle nose deformity and non caseous necrosis seen in histopathology what could be diagnosis see saddle nose deformity is clearly means there should be some nasal septal damage nasal septum has been eroded so nasal septum has been eroded if the nasal septum goes for erosion so we are having a nasal septum so this is a cartilaginous part of the nasal septum this is the bony part of the nasal septum okay so either parts going for erosion can lead to a saddle nose deformity so if the cartilage alone is affected which is again the most common mode of most common mode of septal erosion if the cartilage alone goes for erosion it could be a traumatic okay or it could be a autoimmune such as sarcoidosis if it is infective leprosy rtd so these are the causes for cartilage erosion what could cause bony erosion it is syphilis syphilis causes bony erosion so what causes both cartilage and bony erosion it is vaginus so just looking at the vaginus granulomatosus what are the other points so it could be c and c positive non caseous necrosis so vaginus then pulmonary infiltrates renal failure with injury causing red cell cast then affecting the gums which is called as 
strawberry gums. Okay, so these three are the triers for vaginous granulomatosis. Okay, so in this question, we are having a non caseous necrosis, single instant pathology, and a saddlenose deformity. Any of these could be the causes, but here, due to the non caseous necrosis, which is complementing this clinical question, the answer for this particular question is vaginous granulomatosis. Clear, people? Yes. Fine. So we have done with the rhinology part. Now we are entering into the laryngology part. So again, many questions have been asked. So we will start with a newborn present with following clinical pictures, type of strider. So this is a clear picture of laryngo Malaysia with omega shaped epiglottis. So first we'll start with what are the types of strider. The strider could be inspiratory, expiratory or biphasic. So if there is a lesion above vocal cords, it is inspiratory. At the level of vocal cord, it is biphasic. Below the level of vocal cords, It is expiratory. So laryngomalacia, it is obviously a, a lesion that is occurring above the vocal cords. Larynx has been affected. Laryngo, uh, omega shaped epiglottis. So it is clearly a picture of inspiratory strider, not the other options. Okay, fine. It's a inspiratory strider. Clear? Now, an important question, which has, which are repeatedly asked in the near, near exams. A child presented with sudden breathlessness, strider and tachypnea. Okay, so a child which is presenting with sudden breathlessness, now you should immediately subject su suspect a foreign body throat. So if you suspect that, you should immediately take a X-ray. AP lateral, what is the view? AP lateral. Okay. You should take neck with chest x ray. You should take neck with chest x ray. So, see here in this child, it is present at the level of trichopharynx. Okay. So, in this, the question is immediately you should take an x ray. Only if you take immediate X-ray only, na, you could find out whether the foreign body is still over there or it has come down. Okay, fine. Most of the foreign bodies stuck at the throat are radio opaque only. Okay, fine. Now, if you get across some foreign body, okay, what will you do? First, here, adults. Okay, in babies, first you should do blind sweeping of mouth to search for foreign body. This is step number one. Okay. At the level of mouth. At the level of oropharynx. You should try to remove. Under. Light. For light. Okay. So now it has entered into the larynx. Okay. So in larynx, the patient has started to choke. Either you will do a 
chest compression with two fingers in, in a child or a hemorrhage maneuver so this hemorrhage maneuver will put pressure upon the thoraco abdominal area so it will create a pressure that pressure will create some external movement and will bring out the foreign body so if the patient develops choking na you should do chest compression in children and hemorrhage maneuver in adults so it's a level of larynx so if it has entered into the esophagus what will you do it has entered into the trachea what will you do so trachea immediate broadly rigid only flexible is only for diagnostic purpose so esophagus you should immediately use an esophagus copy you may think that sir will it not the foreign body go down as the days pass so depending upon size of the foreign body because the foreign body is a little bit bigger you can't leave as it is you should immediately do a esophagoscopy okay so with esophagoscopy you are going to remove the foreign body all right so that is an important question that has been asked fine okay now a swelling which is present at the floor of the tongue which is trans ilmenin positive what is the diagnosis see which is clearly a picture of yeah ranula what is a ranula the word rana means frog's belly so it looks like a frog's belly it is a sublingual mucus cyst if it penetrates the mylohyoid muscle if it penetrates the mylohyoid muscle it will be called as see here one one sublingual tumor penetrates the mylohyoid muscle and at the neck see this is sublingual this is neck okay so this is called plunging ranula this is called plunging ranula see there is a oral lesion with neck lesion this is a case of plunging ranula okay so both the cases there will be brilliantly trans elimination positive because it is a cystic fluid so trans elimination will be definitely positive for this baby fine so an another question the exact question i don't know the treatment for adenoid hypertrophy with the hearing loss if the if the child present with adenoid hypertrophy and hearing loss so antibiotics and conditions are not enough you should do a adenoidectomy for gram transition the hearing loss is due to serous or it is media so patient for correcting the adenoid hypertrophy you should do a adenoidectomy that should be the best treatment for adenoid hypertrophy with hearing loss all right so that completes our discussion about the mcqs so i have taken almost 15 minutes i have come covered many important topics for fmg exams kindly make a note of it thank you